I just thought of a little story. There was a, a wise chief, and uh, he had a bunch of young braves that uh, were coming up in age, and they were starting to challenge the the uh, authority of the chief of the, of the tribe. And uh, one day these braves all got together and decided, we're going to trick the chief and we're going to put him in his place and show him that he's not all wise and all knowledgeable. So they, de they devised a little plan. And this plan was is that uh, this brave who was elected would go before the chief and with a bird in his hand, he would say, chief, and he would put the bird behind his, set hand, his back and say, Chief, is the bird dead or is it alive? Well, the time came and he presented himself to the chief and he went in and sat down before the chief and he said, Chief, I have a bird in my hand behind my back. Is it dead or is it alive? And the chief looked at him for a few minutes and, of course, the brave was going to twist the neck of the, the bird if he said, alive and if he said dead then he would just let the bird go and the chief thought for a moment and he thought for a moment he looked at the brave and he says it all depends upon you now isn't that how Darian is it all depends upon you we have a lot of other sources out there that are informational sources that can help us but when it really comes down to it it's the person holding the bird in their hand that really has the ultimate responsibility. And as a dairy producer, you have all, uh, a responsibility for those animals that you raise. And as a grower, you have a responsibility for those animals you have chosen to take into your responsibility and to raise. So we're gonna hit several things. I'm gonna talk as, my background is in calf raising. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, I grew up in the dairy industry, uh, Utah and Idaho. Uh, later on, I went to California and managed a facility there that we had 25,000 head of animals from uh, day old to uh, uh, springers. And then also my responsibility was our maternity ward. And the maternity ward, we calved a cow every 32 minutes. A uh, large facility. And then uh, after being there for several years, I hooked up with a group of investors. And we came to Wisconsin. We built a facility up in Green Bay, which housed 10,000 head and uh, of baby calves up there. So I've seen it in the sun, I've seen it in the snow. So uh, we have some uh, good relationships and some of these things we talk. Currently I'm working with CalfTail as uh, not only their national sales manager but also as their national calf management consultant. I'm on a lot of dairies, I'm on a lot of calf ranches, I'm on a lot of heifer facilities and I see a lot of different things. And a lot of things uh, are going good and some things are not going so good. And so I'd like to talk about some of these things today and how we can maybe work together because it all depends upon us. My motto is, is that what we do today will affect our future. So everything we do today will affect our future, not only personally, but also in the agriculture industry we're in. So whatever we do, it will affect our future. Let's take a little trip. Basically, uh, go on here a little bit. I'd like to talk about some of the things we're going to do. I'm going to walk around a little bit, so, but I'll watch for your hands, and hopefully I don't get in your way here a little bit, but I'd uh, like to uh, take a little trip. And, and uh, as a calf grower, I'd like to start on this side, then I'm going to go and be a dairy producer. So as a calf grower, what I, what is it? this is the process that I would go through to develop a relationship with a, with a dairy producer. First of all, I'm going to visit, uh, do a visual inspection of the, of the facility of the dairy. I want to see if it's clean. And I know that we can't all be perfect, but there's some, just some basic things of cleanliness that we, that we want to look for and, and want to be aware of. I'm going to look at traffic flow. I want to see how many times that uh, they drag through the manure pile over the lagoon area and then they go to their feeding area. That gives me a lot of information that they're not very concerned about what they're tracking around on their farms. And the, where I want to pick up my calves, I want it as much isolated as I possibly can on the farm. I want as many, least amount of people walking into the system where my calves are being born and where the maternity is. I don't want tractor after tractor coming from the lagoon, coming from the skid steers, coming out of the corrals, and then going through my 
area where I may have some calves stored at. So I'm going to look for those kind of things. I may even take a few pictures. I'll ask the dairy producer, can I take a few pictures? And it's interesting, I've done this in the past and take a few pictures and then as we worked with the dairyman over a period of time, we went back and showed him those same pictures and he said, is that my facility? Is that what I really looked like? And, and it's really a, a good tool. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the organization of the dairy. I want to make sure I know who the ownership is. I want to know who the man is that writes the check for me each, each month or each week. I want to develop a relationship. I want to find out where his chain of command is. In other words, some owners may not want me to deal directly with them. They may have a herdsman or they may have a calf uh, maternity area that I will deal with. I want to find out that if I ever have a problem, who's the person that they want me to go to? I don't want to have to worry about when a problem arises, now who do I go to? I want to know that ahead of time. And I'm going to have this all on a, on a, on a sheet. Who will be the contact person? Can this person make the final decision? And I'll ask the owner. And I'll ask, I said, you told me to talk with your herdsman. So if I have a calf that's not doing very good and is having problems, does he have the authority to tell me to put that calf down or whatever to do with it? And that's what I want to know. I, I want to know who has the final say when it, when it comes to this type of situation. I'm going to visit the maternity area. In fact, this is where I will spend most of my time. If I go visit a dairy for the first time as a calf grower, I may spend two or three hours just in the maternity area. And I'm going to walk around and I'm going to dig down in the straw to see how much water is down, inside, down underneath the straw, how often they bed it. Has it been two or three months since they put new bedding in there? I'm going to look for all these kind of things. I'm going to spend a lot of time there. And while I'm there, I'm watching people who have responsibility there. And also, I have a little pad with me, and I'm keeping track of how many people come there that have nothing to do with the maternity area. I want to know where they're tracking from and what they're going to be tracking into the facility. I'm going to look at maintenance and cleanness of bedding, and also, again, I'm going to be very cautious and very noticeable where this location is in, in reference to the farm. So I want to know what's coming in and what's, what's uh, in there. Protocols. One of the things that I'm going to ask for when I get to that dairy is I want to know their protocols for their maternity area. Sad thing about it is not very many of them ever have a protocol. They may have a mutual agreement between workers and the management, but there's nothing written down. Something... I used to have a, a, a leadership, a person I dealt with in some leadership positions, he says, talking about goal, a goal unwritten is only a wish. And if you don't have a protocol written down, it's only a wish that it's going to happen. Because you don't have anything to go back and talk to those people about again, why wasn't this done or why was it done this way or, or what the confusion was. I mean, look at cow placement. I just recently had visited a facility that had a room probably about this size, maybe just a little smaller than this size of this room, and there was 30 cows in it. That's a lot. That is very, very tight. And they were walking on top of each other, and there was a couple of them trying to calve, and as the calves were coming out, I noticed that it was an opportunity for all the sisters and all the aunts to come over and take their lick at the calf and, and make sure it was okay. We don't want these kind of things. So I'm going to look at this very closely, what the number. I'm going to look at the flow of the area. You know, we might have a steam up area, and then we have the actual birthing area. I think that's very important. Have an area, once you see the labor start, have to move them to a, a closer area so you can watch them. You can be aware of what's going on. So I'm going to look for those kind of things. While I'm looking for these things, I'm writing all these things down. I'm keeping a, mental no a, a, a physical written note of what's, what I see. Because what I want to do is I want to share this with the owner before I make a decision if I want to raise their calves or not. Because just because they called me over to their place doesn't mean I'm going to automatically raise their calves. I want to make sure that their, their opportunity and my opportunity are going to be equal and that we're going to be successful together. I'm looking at manpower. Is there enough people in responsibility in the maternity area to take care of the needs? And uh, that's something you're going to have to work out with the, with the owner 
and uh, see what their relationships are. If you're on a small 200 cal dairy, it might be just a family thing. Whoever happens to go by there. I, I grew up on one of those kind of dairies. You go drive past the maternity area on the way to bale the hay, looks like everything's okay. Go bale the hay, come back, mom has had the baby, all is well, you think. So we want to know what the manpower type situation is. I want to look at the bedding. I want to know if they have some records of how often they bed. What's their schedule? What's their protocol? Going back to the protocol. Interesting. Any of you have any idea why I might ask if they have a percentage of DOAs? On average, if I asked a dairyman what their DOA percentage is, that uh, I would say uh, eight out of ten of them have no idea, have not the clue. Why do you think I would ask that? Any thoughts? I'll be bashful. We're all family. Remember, I won't beat you up. Why do you think I would ask him? Tells me that they're keeping records, isn't it? If they're keeping records, then they're, they're really concerned of what's going on in their maternity area. They're not just chalking it up as a dead calf and pull it out to the side where, where uh, the cats and dogs can have their, their day with it. Next thing, next thing I'm going to go to is I'm going to find out about colostrum. I want to find out what they're doing in the colostrum area. So we're going to go and basically what I'm going to do is I want to know when and where is this cow milked. If this cow calved at 4 o'clock in the morning, when is it going to be milked? 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock. If this cow calves at 6 o'clock in the morning, when is it going to be milked? 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon? I want to know because this is something that we can work on and, and talk about. I'm going to walk the process. I may get there or come back another time and say, what time do you start milking your maternity cows or your, your hospital corral? And I may be there at that time and I want to watch. The reason why I want to watch is, is I want to know what's going on. After uh, taking on a client one time, we had some real problems with scouring calves at three and four days of age. Tremendous, almost every single one of their calves would scour. So I called the dairyman and I says, hey, on your paper here, I see that you start milking your maternity and sick uh, your hospital need cows at 4 o'clock in the morning. Is that still correct? Yes. I'm going to be there at 10, 10 to 4. Is that okay? He says, sure, that's fine. So I get there at 10 to 4 and I walk through the process. After it's all done, I ask Jose and Carlos, I says, hey guys, is this how you do it every day? Oh yeah, this is how we do it every day. I says, great, super. Wrote down my responses. Went back to the dairy producer and I says, you know, I, I spent some time with Jose and Carlos this morning in, in the uh, milking area. And uh, they, they told me what they do every day and that they did it the same way this day I was there. And I says, are you aware that they never clean the cows before they start milking them? What were we getting? We were getting a tremendous amount of load of pathogens into our milk on those cows. They had no, they weren't taking the time to wash the udders and clean up the udders and, and prepare the udders at all. We corrected that, three and four day scours went away like magic. That's what happens. It's all part of this walkthrough. Testing. Do I have a colostrometer to test my colostrum? Are you using a colostrometer? I would. Interesting thing about that is, is that uh, we'll talk, talk a little bit about it. I know you've heard millions of things about, uh, about colostrum and, and, and uh, colostrum management. I want to get it to the fridge within at least uh, 30 minutes. The colostrometer won't work until the milk is at what? Room temperature. So how am I going to do that? A lot of guys will take the milk and they'll put it in cold water and they'll watch the temperature real close and then take their sample. So that way the milk starts to cool down and then they'll take it right to the refrigerator. The thing about it is, is too many times I go to, re go to a farm and they've got the colostrum sitting and I say, well, how long has it been there? Well, we started milking two hours ago. Well, every 20 minutes, it doubled its population in bacteria every 20 minutes. So if I left it there two hours, you imagine when I'm going to feed that calf the first time? It's not going to be totally colostrum. It's going to have a, some colostrum with some chunks of bacteria. We've got to get it into the fridge. Don't put it in an old decrepit fish that, fridge that your grandmother passed down to you that was built in the 1932. It's not going to work properly. You've got to be able to cool that milk quickly. Put it in two quart containers. 
nothing bigger than a two quart container. You want to cool that as fast and as quickly as you possibly can. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to ask, hey, uh, do you use a classroom from the first calf heifers? Oh, yeah, we use it. What do you use it on? We use it on the bulls. Good. You're on the program. I prefer to use it on the bulls. I prefer to have mature lactating cows as my colostrum for my firstborn, for my heifers. I try to stay with that as much as we possibly can. Then I'm going to talk to them, and we're going to talk about heifer and bull feeding, which we just talked about. Then I'm going to ask them, do you use any supplement uses? I just want to know. Are you using First Defense? Are you using Secure? Are you using any of these products? I just want to know, so I have a record of it. So when your calves come to my facility, I kind of have some idea what they've already had. Do you give them a shot of penicillin when they're first born? I want to know that. I just kind of want to know what their routine is. I don't want them to be given a shot of penicillin, then I show up on my facility and I give them another shot of penicillin for navel problems, and we start overdosing them. I want to know what's going on. It goes back more and more, we've got to know what's happening. Feeding the class, classroom, we're talking about feeding the classroom. We, my recommendation is within one to two hours after the calf is burnt, born. I want to get a gallon of colostrum into them. If I can't get the calf to suck it, then I'm going to tube it. Because I want to get a gallon of colostrum, good quality colostrum, 101 degrees into that calf within an hour to two hours at the latest after it's born. So if that calf is born at 3 o'clock in the morning, what am I going to do? You have to be prepared. Mother is not going to have a calf at 10 o'clock all the time. You're going to have those at night. We all know that. I want the time recorded, and I want to know where it was fed and who fed it. I want all that on a birth certificate. In fact, I always provide them with a birth certificate that they would fill out for me. Have the mother's name or number, what time she calved, who did the calving, was she a one, two, three, or four, or five pull? You know, and I'd ask, ask for that information. I want to know. And I want to know how much, and I want to know, were you able to get it sucked two quarts, and then you had to tube the rest, or did you tube the whole gallon into the calf? These are things that I put on the birth certificate so we're aware of what's going on. Preparation, let me just touch on that real quickly. Preparing colostrum, just let me give you a little hint here. It's going to come out of the fridge at roughly 38, 39 degrees, right? So you're going to need to get that warmed up to 101 degrees for that calf. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my containers, and I have my two core containers, and I'm going to find me a five-gallon bucket, and I'm going to put 140-degree water in that bucket. And I'm going to set those bottles down in there. About 20 minutes later, 18 to 20 minutes later, they should be ready to go. We don't want to overcook it with 100. Oh, I can do it fast. I'll put 180-degree water in that bucket. You're going to start to break down the colostrum, and it won't be as effective. You want to actually warm it up slowly and very naturally. So these are the things I'm looking at. Also, as I'm, I'm going there, I want to know how clean it is after the calf is born and take it away from his mother. Where is this calf going to go? And I have seen them all. I've seen little uh, refrigerator boxes. I've seen uh, wooden boxes that somebody made. I've seen real nice elaborate systems. The biggest thing I'm looking for is it clean where that calf is going to go. I want to make sure the navel is dipped as soon as possible after it's born, gets put into a clean place, and I want to know if it's accessible. I'm going to be sending a guy there every day to pick up calves. I don't want him to have to crawl under this fence, around this corner, back into the far 50 to find the calf every day. Because he's going to have to carry it out some way or another, and I don't want a workman's comp. Uh, situations. So I want to make, and I'm going to work with the dairy producer as much as I possibly can to find the most accessible place on the dairy that's accessible for his employees and accessible for my employees, that my employee does not have to track through his farm. That's the last thing I want my employee to do. Because the next guy down the road doesn't want to know that my employees tracked all the way through Jones's dairy before we got to the Smiths. I want it to be as clean. I want to make sure there's a cleaning station where my employee can go and scrub off his boots and hands and arms before he even gets started. And I want that cleaning station there again so when he leaves, he can clean off his boots, wash his hands and his arms before he goes on to the next place. We have to make it so we're not taking stuff everywhere we go. 
comfortable to blow down in bad weather. I want to make sure that when it rains that the calves aren't getting wet and totally, you know, that they're not sitting in a lean-to and the rain and snow's coming off the main building, falling onto the lean-to and leaking through. And, you know, I just want to make sure those calves are comfortable. Transportation, I'm going to tell him, you know, what's the best time for us to come to your farm? What's the best time for us to come to your farm? And we start to work out a schedule and access. <clears throat> and then I'm going to ask some questions. Why do you want to have your calves raised by me as a custom raiser? Why? I've heard them all. But you need to know why. And tell you what, write it down. Write it down on this piece of paper that the reason why Jones wants to is because his son's going off to college and he hasn't got anybody else that will do it. Or we don't feel that we're doing a good enough job and we want somebody else who does this professionally to take it over for us. We feel our costs are way out of hand and we feel that maybe a custom raiser can raise them cheaper for us. Whatever the reason they put down, that's what we need. I, I, whatever they say, that's what I want to put down on the paper. I would ask the current situation, is uh, somebody in the family feeding them currently? And I probably want to visit with that person and just kind of find out what some of their tricks that they used or what some of their challenges that they had, just to kind of have a relationship with them because what happens is, is sometimes those people got pushed out of the way, not because they weren't doing a, 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 a bad job, they were probably doing a good job, but there's some changes. So they kind of feel a resentment that somebody's taking their little babies away from them. So I want to develop a relationship and have something available there. Except I want to ask the owner and those involved in making the decisions, what is your expectation of a heifer? 23 months from now, when this heifer comes into your milking parlor, what does she look like? And I'll have him explain it to me. This is what I expect it to look like. This is what I want her to be able to weigh. This is what I want her to be able to milk. You know, get what he feel is his expectations of what he expects from a heifer. Okay, now let's go on the other side here for a minute and talk to the dairy producers. Dairy producers, let's uh, talk about this, you know, going to a custom raiser. Why would I do it? What I want to achieve. And guess what? You need to make a visit. He's come and visited you. You've made a decision now that you'd like to pursue this. Don't just think that everything is good. Go make a visit. Don't rely upon the Joneses down the road that theirs is being raised there and everything is going well. Go visit. How many of you would put your children in a daycare center without going there and visiting the daycare center? None of you would. And if you didn't, we need to call uh, social services anyway. So these are your children. This is your future. You want to know where they're going. Make the visit. And when you make that visit, don't expect to do it in about five or ten minutes. And I'm going to talk about that now. And that's where we want to go into. First meeting. The first meeting is, is that you want to talk about reasons and goals and expectations. You've already talked about some of these things already. But when you go there to visit, let's talk about them again. Let's see if our goals and expectations have changed any. Maybe you as a dairy producer are actually the first one to go to the calf raiser. Maybe he hasn't been to your place yet. Maybe you're the one that's initiating it. Well, this is what I want to know. I want to, we want to get, you, want to, you want to be forefront. What's my reasons for doing this? What's my goals? And we're going to talk about some of these things. Then we're going to listen and take notes. Listen and take notes. Listen and take notes. I can't stress that enough as a dairy producer. Ask some questions. About four years ago, I had a dairy producer uh, call me and says, uh, Lewis, we want to bring calves to your facility. I said, that's fine. And uh, he came over, and we started to talk. And we talked for a few minutes. And I said, you got any questions? He says, no, I haven't got any questions. Well, don't you want to know what I use for vaccinations? Don't you know, know what time I'm going to come and visit you? I had to initiate. I'm telling you guys, you guys can initiate the questions. If the calf raiser hasn't yet, ask questions. Then you want to find out as a dairy producer, who is my contacts and who makes the decisions? 
You want to find out that is it the owner of the calf raising or heifer raising facility that makes all the decisions or does he have a ranch manager that makes the decisions. You need to know and you need to write down and you need to have his number and I would say that you probably need to have some kind of communication with that individual at least weekly. Either by telephone or by sight. You wouldn't take your children again to the daycare without checking in from time to time. Check in. Make them aware of what's going on. One of the things I'm going to do as a, as a dairy producer while I'm there is I'm going to look at, I'm going to take a tour of the facility. I want to see how clean their facility is. I want to see how many old tractors and old uh, pieces of wood and stuff are laying all over the place and papers and blue gloves and all this stuff just scattered all over. I want to know how clean they are because the more blue club, the more blue gloves I find tells me what? They're not very attentive. And if they're not attentive about picking up blue gloves that are scattered all over it, they're probably not going to be very attentive with my animals that I have there. So I want to know that. I want to know the organization. I want to know who, who treats, who the uh, feeding crew is. If there's a management scale, I want to know that. And I want to, I want to meet those people. I want to be aware of who they are. I'm going to look at traffic flow. If I come to visit this facility, do they ask me to go to the office or can I just go wandering around? Well, I can tell you right now that if, that if they say when you come, you can just go wherever you want to and wander around, you might want to be very cautious. If they're not asking you to check into the office with them before you go into their facility, what else is coming into their facility without being known? We need to know. Make notes. Make notes. Oh, let's look at five senses. What are five senses? Look. See what you see. Listen. Smell. Touch. What's the last one? Taste. How am I going to taste? <laughs> now, I don't expect you to taste. What's your gut feeling? As you're making this visit, what's your gut feeling about what's happening here? Rely on that gut feeling. Don't, don't uh, excuse that uh, gut feeling that you might have. But rely on those. Look, hear, see, smell. Make some notes. Meet the key people. Interact with the workers. If you took your children to the daycare, would you want to talk to the teacher? Sure you would. Talk to some of the, the workers. You know, and even if it's just so much as, hi, how long have you worked here? Do you like working here? And if the, if the employee says, no, this is the bummerest job I've ever had, I hate coming to work. Well, I'd be a little bit concerned. My gut feeling would really kick in. You know, this guy's not very happy here. Does that mean when he pulls my calf off the trailer, he's just going to pull it by one ear and a leg and throw it into the hutch? You know, I want to know what, how they feel about uh, working there. Transportation. We're going to ask questions about pickup. How often are you going to come? We're going to establish a, a, a schedule. How often they're going to come? And as a dairy producer, try to get a consistent time. As a grower, try to be as consistent as you possibly can. There's nothing more frustrated than the one day have your calves picked up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and then the next time the guy comes at 10 o'clock at night. Because you don't know if you should have fed that calf the second time or if you should have done something else with that calf because he hasn't shown up. And heifer and calf growers, if you are having a truck problem, if uh, somebody didn't show up for work and you're a little bit behind, make a phone call. It's just called courtesy. It works. And you build a better relationship. You're going to talk about return of animals. So they're going to be here two months. They're going to be here four months. They're going to be here six months. They're going to be here 24 months. How long, do you want them, how long is our, our uh, relationship going to be? One of the things that I'm going to ask as a dairy producer as I go on there, I want to see the calf ranch's protocols. They wanted to see mine, I want to see theirs. And I want to see if they have a written protocol according to who's got responsibility on the farm. I want to see what their protocol is for when my calf gets there. What's, going to, what's the procedure and what's going to happen with my calf when it first gets there. I want to know how they're going to dehorn my calves. How about extra teats? How about tails? Hey, what is their vaccination program? Shouldn't we sit down together and talk about vaccination program? My cows, I'm vaccinating them with this. Shouldn't we have a 
A sit down? Yes. And that sit down should be your personal veterinarian from your dairy producer and yourself and the veterinarian from the calf operation and the calf manager or whoever your responsibility is there. There should be four people, at least four people in that meeting to discuss what the cows are getting and what the calves are going to get. Because aren't the calves going to return one day and you want them vaccinated? Now, you may not be able, there may be some other things we'll talk about vaccination a little bit later, but also what kind of milk is being fed? Are they feeding uh, pasteurized raw milk, hospital milk? Are they feeding milk replacer? You need to know. What happens if the truck breaks down along the road one day and they can't get any past, uh, raw milk to the, the, to the calf ranch to pasteurize? What do they do? You want to know that because every time there's a, a nutrition change in that baby calf, that calf is going to be messed up for a few days and he's probably going to have scours. If he's got scours, somebody's going to treat him. Maybe they don't really need to. So you need to know those things. What is their backup? What's their backup procedure? Ration and nutrition. Do they have a nutritionist that works with them? I would ask them if they do, and I'd ask them who their nutritionist is. Be aware of who the nutritionist is, and, and don't be afraid to call that nutritionist. And say, I understand that you do the nutrition work for so-and-so calf ranch or heifer facility. And uh, just have some kind of relationship there, and maybe just relate to him. You know, when they come back to us, this is what kind of ration we have. So there's a good correlation all the way through. Disease outbreak. Does this calf ranch or this heifer facility have a disease outbreak protocol? Do they know what they're going to do if they have an outbreak? Very few of them know what they're going to do. In fact, very few dairies know what they're going to do if they have an outbreak. Make that part of your protocol. Review past performances. I might ask them, you know, and I hope they're honest with me. When people would come to me, dairy producers, I would tell them. I'd say, hey, some farms I have a half a percent death loss with. And I have a couple of farms that tell you the truth I'm struggling with right now. We have 15 or 16 percent death loss. There's some struggles. But you've got to be honest with them. Because if you're not honest with them, it will come back and bite you. Both ways. Whether you're a dairy producer or whether you're a, a custom grower. Okay, I'd like to talk about just a few things here. Uh, if if uh, some of you probably and maybe have or currently are working with a, 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 a grower and you, and you may or may not have a contract, let me put the stake in the ground right now. I don't care if they're your brother, your brother-in-law, your best friend from high school. I don't care if it's what it is. You make a contract. Because the fastest way to destroy relationships between two friends is over a disagreement because they didn't get it in writing. And you should take nothing personal. Take nothing personal if there is asked to have a contract. You need to have a contract. Let's talk about some of those things that protects the grower and the producer. Read it. Read it, read it, read it, read it, read it, read it. Have somebody else read it, read it, read it, read it. Be aware of it. Know what's in it. Both ways. Understand it, ask questions, and read it again. Some of them can be very simple. Some of them can be very complex, these contracts. But they are, nece they are necessary. Some of the things that you should look for in a contract that should be in a contract is terms. Is there a renewal? Is there an automatic day that we come to that we automatically renew? Or do we have to sit down and renegotiate everything again and so forth? Termination. What if I decide I want to pull my calves out there? Who can, under what conditions, and what's the time frame I have to give them? These are informations in there. There might be in a contract that says a grower can uh, dismiss calves at a certain time. A producer may be able to pull his calves after a 30-day notice or a 60-day notice or whatever is agreed upon. This is very critical. And I'll tell you right now, there's one thing you ought, to, you ought to have in your contracts. And it's in your contract, somewhere in your contract. You should have there, if there is excessive, and you need to define this, death loss, I can remove my animals immediately. I would definitely have that in my contract. Because you want to, if you desire to, you should be able to do that. Okay? Some other things in the contracts. These are just some other, there's many, many things, but these are things that should be in a contract. Pick up and return. 
That should be spelt out. We're going to pick up on a daily basis. We're going to pick up every third day except for the fourth Sunday and the fourth Saturday. If that's the case, put it in there so everybody's aware of it. What is the rations I'm using? What type of milk? Uh, monitoring uh, commodities. How many of us uh, have uh, maybe been with a grower and all of a sudden we got the $8 corn? When we took the calves there, we only had $2 corn. And all of a sudden we got corn that's going out of the way and the, and the producer says, wow, you know, I, I've got to have more money. Housing care. It should be in the contract. What, what's the housing care? Well, they're in the hutches for 60 days or 70 days or 80 days. Then they go to a three-sided barn, whatever it might be. 120 days, they go to a freestyle barn. This should be spilled out in the contract. Vaccination program, make sure your vaccination program is in the contract. And if you are a grower and your dairy producer asks you to do a other out-of-the-ordinary vaccination, it should be in there and what the cost of that extra vaccination uh, time and labor would be. It should all be spelled out in there. Is my cows going to be dehorned? Are there going to be uh, extra teeth? Is there a cost for this or no cost? Monitoring and treatment. Is my cows going to be monitored once a month or are they monitored daily? I hope your contract says that they'll be monitored daily because I did see a contract about three years ago that says that the, the cows would be monitored on a weekly basis. <laughs> I don't understand that. Why weekly? <laughs> okay, some of the other things here are blood testing. Are you going to pull blood to test for total proteins? How often are you going to do it? How many animals? What's my variances? If I get below 5.0, is there a penalty for me? And if I'm at 6.2 all the time or 6.5, do I get a cut in rate? You know, these are things you can negotiate in a contract. BVD testing. Are you going to test all the animals that come into this facility for BVD? I highly recommend it, especially bringing cattle from different sources. Every single calf should be tested for BVD. You can pull an ear notch the day they arrive. If you work with your lab, you can know within five days whether it's positive or negative. What do we do with the positive PVD animals? What am I going to do with them? Things taking in consideration. Death loss. Determine a death loss. What is excessive? What should I maintain? National average right now is 5%. Your, your calf raiser may do better. Maybe as a dairy producer, you're doing better or worse. It could be either way. But that needs to be written out there. What if the death loss goes over 5%? Who's responsible for those animals? Do I get a rebate? These are things you need to discuss in the contract. Injury and non-performing animals. What if uh, Jose or Carlos or Stephen hit one of my calves with a skid steer? Who suffers the loss? Do I get a check for just raising fees of $235 or do I get a check for $2,200? This has got to be spelled out in the contract. I had a bad experience myself. Found out that one of our producers was sending some registered animals to our facility and we didn't know them. We didn't have it in the contract and one of the bulls died. The bull was already sold for $35,000 and it died. The dairy producer says, hey, what are we going to do about this bull? Uh, 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 I don't know what to do. So we gave him a fair amount for it. It wasn't the 35000 but he had already sold it before it came to us. You need to know those things if those calves are coming to you or heifers. Uh, reporting system. Do you have a computer system to keep track of the weights, the shots, the uh, uh, anything else that you're doing, dehorning and stuff? Or is this all kept in on a record? And is it transferable? to my record keeping. If you got Dairy Comp 305, it is transferable. If your calf raiser is using it and your heifer raiser is using it and you're using it as a dairy, it's all transferable. It can all come back to you. And maybe some of the others do. I'm not that familiar with some of the others. Invoicing and billing. How often are you going to be invoiced and billed? Weekly? Twice a month? Monthly? This needs to be spilled, spelled out in the contract. And also, as a dairy producer, who has my calves there, you need to spell out, do I have to have payment back within 10 days or within 30 days? This all needs to be spelled out there. I know we're giving you a lot of stuff here. Record keeping again, bull arrangements. Sometimes some calf raisers will take the bulls as well and market them for you or raise them for you. This can be also part of the contract. Price increases. Let's suppose I uh, put them in there in January and 
Corn is $2, and come uh, July, corn is up to $6. People, the calf raiser can't absorb everything in the world. There has to be some negotiation in there. Corn went up for you on your dairy as well if it went up for him. You've got to negotiate, and you've got to have a way of negotiating, and you can spell that out in your contract. It's very easy to do so. Unforeseen obstacles or costs as well can be in there. How about if a tornado comes through? Let me get, let's go through that. Right here. Provide healthy calves, dairy producers. Give them nothing but healthy calves. You got this calf that's got the brain sticking halfway out of its head. Don't sand it. Put a note on it. Calf ranch, please do not pick up calf. <laughs> you know, we'll take care of it. Uh, paying invoices on time. Properly ID your animals. Uh, that's very, very important. Have a birth record, some kind of a birth record. Allow grower access. I try to visit my, my uh, dairy producers at least once, or, once every two or three months. I try to visit and see what's going on and be there. Another thing is insurance. Be careful on this. Are your animals insured when they're away from your facility? You might want to talk to your insurance agent and find out if those calves leave your facility, are they insured? And when they're being transported, is my insurance covering them or is the calf ranch facility or heifer facilities insurance covering them? I know some very sticky situations that didn't take this in consideration. They thought each other's insurance co companies covered it. Waste milk arrangements, maybe you're going to sell your waste milk or give your waste milk to them as a part of a cut in price in your, your daily rate. Those things. And then, of course, death loss. What is death loss? Some people say an hour after a calf is born, if it dies, it's dead. You know, it's considered death loss. They give it at least an hour. Some say, say 72 hours. If the calf dies after 72 hours, then we start counting it as, as death loss. I was on a facility here a few months ago, and we got talking. And they said, wow, our death loss. And I said, what, what kind of death loss? Said, well, we're, we're under 2%. I said, wow, that's great. How are you doing that? So we got talking, we got talking, and they don't start counting death loss until the calf's been there two weeks. I'd love that kind of arrangement. <laughs> My death loss would be 1%. Okay, so you need to know. Define what your death loss is and what it is with the, with the person as you work this with them. Charges, develop what your charges be. Is there going to be any exclusive things ex that's going to happen? Special vaccinations? Are you going to have your cattle branded? If, if I have a dairy producer that says I need my cattle branded, well, that means I've got to take them through the shoot a, a, a separate time. I've got to spend extra time with that. So it should be in, entitled to an extra charge for, for branding and so forth. Title of animals, calf ranches. I can't stress this enough. Do not accept animals that don't have proper titles. Because if the dairy ever goes bankrupt, you have nothing to go on to. In the state of Wisconsin, there's a feeder uh, ordinance. That if somebody goes bankrupt and you're feeding their animals, when they uh, settle up in their bankruptcy, you're the first one to get paid. But if the animal has no title, you're on a long road of a lot of court days to try to figure out who's going to pay you for that animal. So make sure that those animals have title and that they didn't bring them across the border or steal them from somewhere else and show up at your, your place. Arbitration, this is something we hope that never happens, but having your con in your contracts, if there is arbitration, this is the procedure we'll do. We'll bring in a third party and it'll be discussed this way. Have these things in your contract. Be aware of state laws. They vary from state to state. Be aware of what's in your state and what's available. And amendments or mod uh, modifications, when you do those, make sure you sign them with a notary public and each person has a copy and it's stapled with the original copy and it's put on file somewhere so everybody knows there was an amendment to our current contract 10 years ago. Disease control, I'm just going to hit this real quickly because we're actually going to run out of time here, but disease control is it will happen. Not when it will happen, it's how we're going to minimize the effect. It will happen. I don't care where you're at, it will happen someday. So how are we going to do it? What is outbreak? Outbreak is the inability to not be able to control the spread of a disease by using usual protocols and treatments. At this time, 
what you want to do if you have an outbreak is you want to develop a team. Should be the owners on both sides, the management on both sides, key employees, producers, veterinarians from both sides, nutritionists, and other network people. It could be colleges, universities, extension offices, whatever it might be. Gather together a team. And what's this team going to do? This team is going to start gathering information. They're going to make a timeline and they're going to start looking at changes. On the CAF side, on the CAF uh, operation, they're going to start looking at, uh, somewhere I lost my thing here. So on this side here, they're going to see has there been a schedule change? Has there been some feed changing? If I got some mold and some silage or some high moisture corn that I got fed some reason or another? Have I had employees, the weather, protocols, transportation, visitors? that I'm not aware of. Or maybe I took on a new client and about uh, three weeks after I took on a new client my whole herd breaks out. Or after I bought some cattle from somewhere else about three weeks later the whole herd breaks out with something. Take in consideration. You want to make a timeline. You want to gather information. You want to review the protocols. Communicate. Clean, clean, clean. Animals. Take some organ tissues. Take some fecal tissues. Send them off to a reputable uh, lab get your information, find out, have your feed sampled. I have found so many times that with, with outbreaks we've traced it to feed. Because most feed piles are not very well attended and every bird in the county nests there. Especially seagull season. Be aware of your feed. Identify and then do some more cleaning and more cleaning and more cleaning. What does, it, what does it boil down to? Well, we have a contract grower, a dairy producer, and we have a total balance in results. We're going to be able to produce an animal that's going to be the success of your farm and your facility and your family for years to come.